right now. Good luck. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ramon Iriarte. I'm a specialist of education programs at the Regional Education Office of UNESCO for Latin America and the Caribbean. Welcome everyone to this conversation online that we have named ChatGPT Perspectives and Scope for Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you everyone from different countries in the region and the world. We want to thank our distinguished guests that will share with us their visions, experiences and reflections on a topic that has become more and more relevant in the last few years, but in particular in the last few months. AI is a field centered around the creation of systems and machines capable of doing tasks with cognitive and education capabilities that humans have, but in the machines. This will be quite a challenge for education. There are risks and challenges. We are here to generate awareness and to generate a debate with the different stakeholders about around the role of AI tools, around them, ChatGPT, for the development and future of education. Before we begin, I want to let you know that we have simultaneous interpreting into Spanish and English. If you are um, in the Zoom platform, you can go to the world icon and select the language of your preference. We want to thank Andrea Torino that will be interpreting throughout the event. We are recording this webinar so that it can be shared later through our digital channels. I invite you to share comments and questions that you may have through the chat tool that is available at the Zoom platform. We will select some of these contributions to be answered throughout the discussion with the panel that we have. To begin, we will have Welcoming words by Baltensir Menders, Head of Education of the Regional Education Office of UNESCO for Latin America and the Caribbean, who is now to take the floor. We hear you. Thank you so much, Ramon. Regards for everyone here today connecting through Latin America and the Caribbean, but also from other regions in the world. We know that uh, there's a lot of you connected. In the name of Orelac UNESCO, it's a pleasure to repeat our welcome to this conversation that is so relevant these days for our region about chat GPT. Perspectives for education in Latin America and the Caribbean. I want to thank you all, if you can turn on the camera so that we can thank you for your presence here today. We have Dr. Helen Crompton, we have Florencia Ripani, Majo Velázquez, Martin Cáceres, and also here with us, we have a group of experts here with us that made contributions through videos and messages that are three minutes only as uh, showing a reflection on AI in the world of education. So we want to thank everyone for your contributions. As you know, ChatGPT is part of what is known as generative pre-trained transformer intelligence, which is com a conversational tool. This new tool makes not only predictions, but it can also generate new content or very similar with a style that's very similar to content generated by humans. We will listen to the details uh, with the experts, but I will like to begin this webinar with a reflection as from UNESCO. As you know, the technologies related to the family of AI as deep learning, 
for instance, has been with us for more uh, in development for more than 40 years. And AI applied to education, we can see, say it started around the 70s. The good news is that there are investig uh, investigator researchers that are working in the avant-garde of these fields and they are present here in person or through the videos. In the last few years, we can say in the era of implementation, but because of the big data and the computational capabilities and the internet, we're seeing an acceleration that is exponential of these AI systems, machine learning, deep learning, where ChatGPT is anchored. All that is pushing this acceleration. If we look at Latin America and the Caribbean, we can say that the OpenAI platform, the one for ChatGPT, has received already more than 300 million visitors. There's a big interest in the region, as you see. But the, the tool also is criticized. You must have seen a letter signed by thousands of people, including founders of technological companies, asking for a pause for more research on these tools. And two days ago, only Naomi Klein, the researcher with the famous book, was very critical in, at the Guardian article called AI machines are not hallucinating, but they are creators are. Uh, please take a look at that article. She says that for AI, generative intelligence to be beneficial for the humanity and the environment, we need to implement it in a different manner with a different social economic order. And it also touch, touches a point in the intellectual property aspects. There are no new releases like AI PAL 2 that Google just launched. So there is now a true competition, if you want, by private companies in this field of chats, such as chat GPT. At UNESCO for decades, we've been working on the application of technologies in the field of education, in particular since 2008, roundabout, we have been working strongly in trying to understand a, the relationship between AI and education. In 2019, we have publicized the Beijing Consensus, which was the first document providing orient guidelines on how to better make the most of these technologies for education and to push the Education 2030 Agenda by UNESCO. And at that time, when one of the panel members, Florencia, at the time we presented this document in Buenos Aires at the regional level, there was a very interesting debate at the time. Amongst the recommendations from the, with the first document we had, the first point, to take good care of ethical, transparent use and verifiable algorithms. This is applied to ChatGPT. As you know, it is known that ChatGPT is not totally transparent. It's like a black box. We would like to learn more about its algorithm in order to move forward. Second point, you need to consider that AI application can have different biases inherent to the data because it's nourished or feeds from a very specific technology and the way it uses these algorithm processes we need to know about. And third, we need to know about the balance between open access and data privacy. And we are to consider legal aspects and ethical risks related with intellectual property and the privacy of the data and with the well-being of the general audience. Fourth, 
we are to adopt principles in relation to ethics, privacy, and security as part of the design of all of the applications of AI applied to education. And it's part of this claim that we have as from UNESCO. There are several specific points, as you see. The ethical implications are at the core of the concerns that we have as the United Nations. And in that sense, in 2021, 20, uh, UNESCO went even forward in the work with AI. In 2021, 193 member states of the General Conference of UNESCO have adopted the recommendation on the ethics of AI, and it was the very regulatory tool on this aspect. It's like an ethical compass that we want to mention here today. It's key, it's a global basis to build solid respect by the rule of law and in the digit and the digital world. Let me mention some of those recommendations later if we have the time. But now I want to briefly mention a few in relation to AI and education. Our studies so far identify that the main challenges that we have is bias of data when using the tools, you know. This tool is trained with millions and millions of data it has. So if the data have prejudices or biases, that will be impacting the results. So we need to make sure that this is used in a coherent manner. Ethics and privacy that we mentioned before as well, as regards education, academic integrity, plagiarism, is essential. So the training of educators and the whole community, you need proper education to understand how AI works, how to integrate it in the classroom, how to better use it the best way. We are talking about literacy in relation to AI, and we need to ensure equal access. AI can even deepen the gaps that we already have. We know our region has a high level of inequality, so we need to do a lot to prevent this from happening. The fifth point, and let me wrap up, we need to continue reinforcing digital capabilities, critical thinking, and these skills that, you know, have to do with digital competencies, the human competencies, critical thinking, reflections, etc. We need to continue making it possible. Interpersonal skills, collaboration, solidarity, communications. These skills are gathered, many of them, as from the uh, point that is uh, the ODS. 4.SDG 4.7. So as you uh, use chat GPT or these apps, you can derive benefits. It can help with personalized learning. It can support adaptive intelligent learning. It can be a support to the teachers that need support so much and more tools and to increase and improve the results of all of our students, of course. It can also support at the systemic level. If we consider the hundreds of applications that we're having in these systems, we see one that has to do with early warning systems. There are examples of in Argentina and Chile and other countries. These systems that are connected with the information for management, for educational management, their AI is empowering these mechanisms in order to raise warnings when a student is at risk of abandoning the system or dropping out. So we have very, several good examples to move forward. But in Latin America, 
considering the experiences, we see these type of examples and we have others, the application directly at the classroom of AI, but still we have a long way to go in relation to learning, to getting to know these techniques in a deep manner and to be involved in ethical uses of AI. And let me reinforce key points from the UN and UNESCO for us to move forward in the proper use of AI. The recommendation that we have by UNESCO has to do with values and principles, action that has to do us from the data policies, gender, research, we have 11 points. If we analyze this recommendation, we see that there are suggestions specifically as regards to education. And let me quote briefly. First, as we were mentioning, we have to educate our educational communities in relation to AI. We have to improve the acquisition of the a prior competencies for education. What do we mean? We talk about literacy, basic literacy in AI. We know our continent has a deficit as regards language, math, and sciences competencies. Out six out of 10 students in the sixth grade are not reaching a minimum level. So we need to work very much in this regard. Third point, we have to promote programs that raise awareness in the population in general about the progress of AI. What we're doing here today, learning together what AI means. Fourth point, encourage in research on responsible and ethical use of AI in education and teachers training. And I do recommend for you to follow these guidelines. We see very interesting points, very relevant for education systems to use AI the best way possible. And now we invite you to please find the new pieces of work that UNESCO is doing in this regard. We want to thank you once again. We invite you to continue debating on the implications of the expansion of AI in the field of education, as in the case is of ChatGPT, to have continuous learning in an equitable manner for everyone so that it can support us all in progressing in education. I'm very happy to hear you, Ramon, now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Valtensir Mendez, the head of education of UNESCO office in Chile, for this introduction to the conversation. We are very happy to have regards from in the chat from so many countries. We have teachers, headmasters, members of the education community of Argentina, Chile, Peru, Mexico, Honduras, Uruguay, uh, Brazil, Sp Spain, Trinidad and Tobago, Curaçao, Mexico, Bolivia, Honduras. We have representatives from the civil society and the public sector that have worked with us and collaborated with short videos that will be presenting about AI. These videos are available at the website that we're sharing with all of you at the chat right now. Now, let me introduce Dr. Helen Crompton. Crompton, please turn on your camera so that we can see you. Thank you, Helen. Dr. Helen Crompton has a degree in mathematics, technology, and education, and she works on the integration of technologies and the learning with technologies such as AI, mobile devices, and cultural 
uh, virtual or augmented reality. She has been a teacher primary level and at the university. She is now the executive director of digital innovation and learning, and she works at the Old Dominion University in the US. She is executive director of Crompton Consulting. She is in the list of Stanford University in the US, acknowledging 2% of the best scientists in the world. She will share her views, her experience and perspectives in relation to AI and education. We hear you now, keynote speaker, Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, and it's great to be here today. So, um, ChatGPT, what educators need to know. So, this is going to be a very fast overview, but um, here's a quick outline what it is, what ChatGPT is, how to use it very quickly, then all important challenges, but the affordances as well that this tool brings us. So first question, what is ChatGPT? For those that have not yet been able to see it, it th this screen here literally shows a screenshot of kind of the homepage. And if you can see right at the bottom there, there's a place that you can ask questions. So the interface there at the bottom, you can ask a question like I've asked here, what are Newton's law of motion, laws of motion? Now, before we look at the answer, you might be thinking, well, wait, what about the home of ubiquitous answers in Google? You can just ask Google there a question. And here we are, what are Newton's law of motion? And it gives us an answer here. It gives us websites to go to, to be able to find that answer. Now, we're all very familiar with Google here. We've seen what it does. And these answers here, we go off to those websites to find. Now, this has not changed in the last 20 years. In fact, the only slight difference over the last few years is when we ask for it to search, we'll get a lot of advertisements at the top. And in fact, Google get 58% of their revenue from advertisements on Google search. Now, when ChatGPT came out, it caused a great commotion. And actually in Google, they had a email that went out with a code red, meaning we're in trouble. Because we're at a time now with ChatGPT in that this is a moment in history that we'll all remember. I would say as big as, nearly as big as Gutenberg's printing press, um, and the internet where that came out, ChatGPT is gonna go down in history. So let's have a look. What exactly does ChatGPT do? You can see here, I put the question in at the bottom. What are Newton's law of motion? And Google brought those websites in. Instead, what ChatGPT does, there, there's a screenshot, it actually gets us the answer and gives us the answer there, uh, currently in this one in text. Um, so it gives us the answer, it actually goes out, but rather than grabbing from websites and taking kind of snapshots of text, it looks at all the information off those websites to then bring in the answers in its own words. So what is ChatGPT? Let's go a little bit further. ChatGPT is a type of chatbot. And you're probably all familiar with chatbots, basic chatbots such as, you know, how can I help you on a shopping website? Oh, I'm looking for a watch. Here it is, let me find you a watch. Um, we see them on banking sites, we see them on many different things. But ChatGPT is very different. In my view of this, you have the basic chatbots those chatbots that are just kind of feeding you little bits of information, perhaps shopping, banking, like I said. ChatGPT is like having 
a conversation with an expert being. Um, there's a picture there of um, Jarvis off Iron Man, if anyone's familiar with that, or Star Trek data. So in other words, it's like a, it's like a person there, and it's like you're having a conversation with that person. Remember, I'm not just asking them a question. There's a conversation going on. So I might ask a question and then say, oh, tell me a bit more about this, or tell me a little bit more about that, or I, I like that bit, but I don't like that. Give me something else. And it will have a back and forth conversation with you, finding those answers. Now you heard just before what GPT stands for. This is very important. And GPT is not just for chat GPT. So there's, you might have seen Prot GPT, which is the protein um, AI program that kind of folds proteins and tells you which way, um, what, what's happening that way. So chat GPT, G is for generative. It's part of AI programs that generate. It gives us something, it creates something. We can get generative AI programs that generate text, generate images, generate video, music. There's all sorts of different types. So this is just one. The pre-trained means it's been given a lot of information. So that information, we're gonna look at that in a second, what ChatGPT has had. And Transformer is basically describing the architecture of the AI, which we could kind of push that off to one side, although for those that wanna go further into it, um, that Transformer AI is what's causing all this promotion with the large language modeling in that anything could be a language and it can actually decode and give us lots of example of that language. So for us at the moment though, um, it's the architecture of the AI. Now the pre-trained, like I said, for ChatGPT, it's trained on Bing. The original version of ChatGPT is trained on Bing up to 2021. So everything off the internet up to then. And um, then it had Wikipedia and a few other things. Then it's also trained on human labeling. So what it did is they had ChatGPT there and it gave out three or four response answers, you know, examples. And what the person did would they would choose the best response. So that's the human labeling to try and get it to improve somewhat. And then you get ChatGPT and you can see the arrow there meaning it's going so much further and it's moved on already. Now we're going to the misuse and limitations. These are the big points that kind of people are interested in. Cheating, plagiarism, inaccuracies, bias, and those harmful uses. So cheating. Um, yes, we can ask questions, our students can ask questions, and it will provide those answers. Um, what I will say is a lot of people, lots of educators are thinking, we're okay, the plagiarism checkers will catch up and will we be okay. That is not necessarily the case. What happens is when things are brought in new, other things come in to try to um, kind of tweak the system. So for example, a student could ask for a paper to be written on a topic that they have to hand in. Plagiarism checks will say, oh, is it human or is it AI? Well, what the student could do is they could just get the AI version put in a few spelling mistakes or ask the AI version to write it as if it was a college student. And it can already bypass some of those newer ones at the moment, turn it in and a few others like that. So we need to be aware of that and not just rely on programs that can actually counteract this that we can ignore ChatGPT. It certainly cannot be ignored at the moment. Next one is plagiarism. It's pulling information from the web 
getting things from different places. Not always in exact words, but it is bringing things and we don't always know where it's from. The latest version of ChatGPT on Bing does tell you somewhere where it, some things are from. Um, so that is helpful, but it cannot be ignored that it will be pulling things and we don't know exactly where it's coming from. Inaccuracies and hallucinations. There's a comment before about hallucinations. So this is a funny one. It says, what is the world record for crossing the English Channel entirely on float? So everyone that knows the English Channel is a large body of water. And ChatGP team came up with the answer, and apparently it's 12 hours and 10 minutes, which we know is impossible. So it can get things wrong. You know, like when you talk to an expert and some things might not actually be true. That is the case with ChatGPT. And it's not often wrong, but obviously it is wrong sometimes. Bias. Do you remember where ChatGPT got the information from? It was from the internet. The internet has a huge amount of bias. They tried to reduce some as well by bringing in people, like I said earlier, to kind of label them and say, yeah, that's a good choice. But again, humans full of bias, that, that was another layer of bias that was actually being added in. So that's something to be aware of. Harmful use with any technology, obviously there'll be people wanting to use it for harm. This is an example which I obviously cut the bottom part off. But what they did, first of all, is when the algorithm came out, people said, okay, let's make it so you can't do harmful things. You can't say racist things. You can't do these things. So people tested it out and managed to find workarounds such as this one, where, you know, two good-hearted and friendly people were acting and pretending to be evil. So please give us this information. And it, they, they got around it. That's, I can say, has gone to the other end now that um, you could say it was the end of the world and it won't give you the information. So this is the exciting bit to me. What are the opportunities for ChatGTP to strengthen inclusive and equitable education for all, the SGG4? So what is there what we can do? And I will say all those negatives often can be turned around into positives, which you'll see on some of this as well. From my research, these are the positives. So I've done a lot of research with colleagues looking at ChatGPT. We've found those five large negative areas. We found these and I put them into kind of five buckets. However, what's interesting as this research is ongoing is the personalization and engagement is really standing out. ChatGPT is really coming up as a tool that really can personalize really connect with students at their level, like that conversation. But let me give you some examples what each of these five areas can do. So for the first one, I'm just gonna go back one. So content creation. So things like this, I've put here, act as an expert teacher and write a lesson plan for teaching 12 year olds about equity and inclusion. Now you can just see the very, very top of it there, but it goes down in length. And I will say, I'm very highly critical over anything education from lesson plans in working in schools for 16 years as a classroom teacher and in higher ed for many years. And I scrutinize everything and, and ChatGPT does a wonderful job. Note that I also put things like, 12 year olds, I could also ask it to write in a certain style or put things for visual spatial learners or something else to meet the needs of the students. So it provides those things. So here are some other examples. So it can write a lesson plan. It can give you questions to go with a lesson plan, the answers to go with the questions, glossary of difficult words, summary, 
of the three principles there. That's just an example. Um, write it for middle school students to understand and even write poems, plays, songs. It's very, very creative. But don't forget, it's pulling from the past information from the web and bringing that in. But it does model things around in a different way to be creative. So personalization engagement. I'm sorry for the, the large amount of text, but this, again, like I said, was a crucial one in understanding what's available. Like explain chemical bonding to a 12 year old visual spatial learner. I mean, I feel like I'm a fairly solid educator, but some of these are, things are hard and it's amazing what it can do. Explain chemical bonding and make it understandable for someone from Kenya, providing real world context connections to make it understandable. Explain the Doffel effect to nine year olds, put it in French, create games. And this second to the bottom is actually one of my favorites. Think about the best ways to educate students. And one of those going way back to the Socratic method is thinking about having question and answers debates. A student could go to ChatGPT and say, I would like to debate with you about free education for all primary age school, school students. And it will say, yes, you know, which side would you like to take? And it will have a debate on any topic and go back and forward. I mean, rather than a, a term paper, that would be a great assignment to hand over. Then tutoring and 24 seven support for the students. You know, a student that's struggling, give me real world examples. Help me understand, break this complex prob uh, problem down. You know, have I got this answer right? If I've not, you know, what did I do wrong? What could I do better? What are low cost strategies for studying? What's the most affordable place to go to college? It can compare everything. It can pull all the information on the web and tell you exactly what college has this, like you spent a day or a week exploring what all those colleges, what all those schools did. So it's very exciting. Assessment tool creates tests and I've put a little star there, it can evaluate test. This is great for students wanting to go in and say, okay, um, this paper I've written or this paragraph, does it sound right? How could it be better? So it gives that support. Um, for educators though, it's great in creating tests that are more focused on the actual students. I have to mention automation for teachers, anyone that's been an educator, we have a lot to do from writing emails, summarizing long texts, developing those plans, doing all these different things. Those things take us away from students from the time that we spend. So these are very useful. Now, if you think back to all these things that we've had so far, going back to here, there's a lot of this provided for places that have the money. They have people that can do marketing, that can sit on one side and write summaries and do all these things. This is a great tool for equity in that students can literally, and educators can get this automatically through ChatGPT. It can do a lot of these things for us. It's just knowing how to use it to be effective in teaching. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Muchas gracias uh, a la doctora. Helen Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Dr. Helen Crompton, for your interesting presentation. It was a very didactic manner to present AI and opportunities and challenges for education. We want to invite Helen to remain with us for this panel that we are starting right away. 
We want to say hello to everyone from Bolivia and from further away, Nepal, Bangladesh. Dear friends, in this event, we are now having an interesting debate with a panel with different specialists in relation to education and technologies. Martin Cáceres from the Ministry of Education of Chile, Maria Florencia Ripani, director of Ceibal Uruguay Foundation, and Maria Jose Velázquez, specialist in digital education from UNICEF Latin America and the Caribbean, and as a moderator, the head of education for Latin America and Santiago uh, from San, and the Caribbean from Santiago, Chile, or ELAC UNESCO. It was a brilliant presentation. In a practical manner, it helps us to understand the actual possibilities of this tool. So I see that there are questions already in the chat for you. We encourage everyone in social media to use the hashtag we have, we'll write it on the chat to continue this debate in the net, in the media, social media. We have a great panel today. Let's start with alphabetical order. Dr. Martin Cáceres, director of the Center of Innovation from the Ministry of Education in Chile. Thank you, Martin, for being here with us. We also have Maria Florencia Ripani, director of Ceibal Foundation from Uruguay. As you know, very successful experience we have in Latin America and the Caribbean for years now, working on IT technologies and communication technologies applied to education. And we also have a UN partner, Majo Velázquez. She is specialist in digital education from UNICEF. For Latin America and the Caribbean, we will hear her contribution as from this other UN agency. And Helen will stay with us in the panel to continue the discussion. Well, without further ado, let me begin now with Martin Cáceres. Let me ask you, Martin, as from your experience, I know in Chile, you're working very intensely in the recovery of education with these collectives that are being left out of the system. So as from this inclusion perspective, which are, in your view, some of the benefits, potential benefits of the use of AI in education that can support the different educational contexts with this view in the communities that are more marginalized? And any example you have to share, we hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Val. We want to thank everyone here today around this relevant topic. And thank you, Helen, for your presentation. It was magistral in showing different aspects of how it works and details of how to implement it. So potential uses, many, as uh, very well Helen showed all of us. But as it is a free of charge tool already available, it can be very useful for all contexts and in particular to reinforce pedagogies in those contexts that need it the most. Let me tackle this question as from conversations I had with teachers recently to see their views in uh, to bring their views in their debates. I work in public policies and we have worked in different spaces, but let me tell you that this very week I was at a pedagogic course and we had a little debate there with students as well. And I asked them how they felt, how they took it studying pedagogy well, very strongly we have the eruption of open AI. One of the things they said, a very deep message, and I think it needs to be heard. A student said that he was very afraid, existential fear, actually, anguish even, because he was wondering 
what's the point for a student in a world with AI, with generative AI, to learn yourself as anything you can ask ChatGPT. So why a student will make an effort in learning and writing well or solving complex exercises, you know, mathematics in depth, that takes a lot of time. And now you can quickly ask ChatGPT. So it's a deep question. What's the meaning of learning and what's the meaning of teaching where have it when you have this powerful tool at hand? And then another student in replicating to this, what he said was that in a world with the eruption of new technologies, it is our task and responsibility of the schools to adapt to the new coming technologies. This has happened in the past, in the last hundred years, we have had large technologies, discussion changes, we have changed the way we interact with even democracy, the way we interact with ourselves, you know, and we've always had the challenge that the education system are to be up to date and very little happened in that regard. And um, this, the school may not adapt to uh, the new tools and it may become obsolete. So it's quite a challenge. That's the other, the second point. And the third point of view, I asked some teachers, how are they using it right now at the classroom? Very interesting answers in relation to, and I line to what Helen was saying, a math teacher was saying that in the south of Chile, a, a school with not a lot of good resources, only they have one computer and internet connection. That's the standard that we have in many public schools. And as a math teacher, what he's doing in the classes, he asks ChatGPT to solve math problems, difficult problems. And then ChatGPT gives the result and explains how to do it. So they go, the ChatGPT may make a mistake. So the students not only do the exercise, but they can have the perspective in criticizing how ChatGPT solves the problems. That is pretty interesting. And then the language, you're interacting and you can ask for stories about different things and you can refine or fine tune the stories, the biases and the different views and you can generate literary creations that are very interesting for analysis. And it's pretty much complex and enriching than just looking up for things on the internet. And some teachers were saying that they were using it to get ideas, ideas for questions to a hundred questions about Newton's laws. It's a question you can ask in the classroom. It's not easy to look it up even uh, on the internet. So that can facilitate creative work of teachers, ideas for activities in classrooms. For instance, how can I tackle these in a, as a group work? Because ChatGPT works with the internet and in very generously teachers have shared very generously a lot. So you have plenty to get hold of and it can facilitate uh, life for teachers if you see it as as assist and as 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 an assistant can be very powerful assistant you cannot as any assistant you cannot blindly trust in him or her but you can it can save a lot of time you can personalize tasks for your students leverage complex skills some say how can we reinforce critical thinking and creativity? I think that's the big challenge with this growing of the digitalization. We need to see how to use this powerful assistant to reinforce what makes us human, which is creativity, curiosity, critical thinking. 
we wonder what makes us human and it's quite a debate but if we things go that way in my view it can be a great allied in us from chile we need to push for citizens digital citizenship that is citizenship through reflective use of the digital world our participation creation and innovation with digital tools we think ai and chat gpt can be a powerful allied having the safeguards of course in place and considering always it in a critical manner thank you so much martin you have offered plenty of examples as from the experience of chile i will not make comments because there are very uh, a lot of questions in this topic now florencia florencia ripani she is the director of fundacion seibal seibal foundation in uruguay if you remember two or three years ago we were presenting that unesco document there in buenos aires we couldn't imagine that we would have now something like this for a few months only and you know we see the power of a tool such as chat gpt so let me make progress in this direction let's see what are the concerns that or inconveniences that you see in applying ai to education how can we overcome the negative impact of chat gpt and other tools that will be coming up you know soon so how can we use it for public well-being and for learning? Florencia, we hear you. Thank you. We are to think how to overcome the disadvantages, but we need to think there are a lot of advantages and our colleagues pointed out uh, to this. I think one of the main inconveniences is lack of knowledge we are very much unaware a lot is said about chat gpt but we don't know there are some early adopters students and teachers that have as martin was saying interesting contributions to make i will tell you about this but the, as with everything everyone has to do, uh, has its own opinions. It has to do with biases, lack of transparency of the sources and models applied. There are 8 million documents. Chat GPT is working as from 8 million documents, more than 10 billion words, and this generates parameters. 175 million parameters, and it generates answers and information now wh what's the composition what is it all coming from we know that most of the documents come in english so we can all clearly see that there are minority groups and the knowledge of certain cultures or groups that are not present uh, in english are not represented in the answers provided by chat gpt so it is very common that the academic sources are papers from the us mainly and if you compare this against other search engines, you will find more diversity of origins and different publications. So there are biases. You need, what can we do as from the educational field? We have many of opportunities with the children and young people. The resources are not used when the ministry says so, but when society 
uh, takes uh, takes them. There is a lot of children and young people using this resource. So it's important to promote good criteria in using these AI tools, in particular generative AI that have such have had such an impact. Here we have different fields. One has to do with understanding the biases that the uh, answers may not be accurate. And you need to know how to do the prompts. Not anybody can obtain the best use of chat GPT if you don't know how to ask. So the building of the prompt has some secrets or processes that you are to follow the same way as when you look it up on the internet uh, that certain procedures help you out better to obtain information. And it's very important as users and students, because we're talking about education, to know about the topic and have the possibility to assess with criteria if the results obtained are close to reality or not to have some idea. In the exploration I did with a lot of students, this was one of the most common answer from those using it. I talked to a group of students of economic sciences and they used chat GPT very successfully for statistics, for generating databases. Nevertheless, for mathematical problems that are highly complex, the results apparently are pretty poor because there are many possible variables and there the chat does not have a good performance. So what does it mean? It's a very powerful tool. There are so many resources to use in the field of education, content, production, proposals for learning and teaching compared against other sources. If we talk about social sciences, you can task revisionist historical texts and compare it against what chat GPT makes and to make a critical active use of the tool. Now, we need to understand as well that this is not coming up in isolation. You were saying that in the 70s, we had the very first systems that could somehow be intelligent enough in order to say AI. But it was in 1956 where we have the Dark Close Conference where we start discussing AI. So we, it, we have gone through many decades and this will continue to grow. We will have new resources coming up. And what happens is that every time we have a device related to the digital technology offering a lot more powerful capabilities to what we were used to makes us wonder, it generates questions and makes people be afraid. That is good because with this, we will be critical of the systems, but this process will continue. And the technology is created by humanity, men and women in the search of trying to expand our physical and mental capabilities. And we need to look for the best way to use it. In principle, AI, generative AI does not respond if you don't ask. So that's one of the points. You need to know what to ask and how. It, and it offers a very interesting landscape to improve in work skills, to simplify tasks, a universe opens up that we're only beginning to see. Now, in the educational, in the education field, what are the paths to follow? We know digital literacy is quite a challenge, in particular in our region. So, we this meets us, finds us with a big, big challenge. So, we need to strengthen lit digital literacy for students and teachers with ecosystem, these systems that are more and more intelligent. We need to add significance to formal processes, admin tasks, writing mails, working with databases and involvement 
in uh, learning. We also need to consider research. Research is essential to work on specific actual data, in particular applied in research. And it would be interesting to have international networks acting as observatories to favor transparency of AI system, these black boxes that we don't know, uh, we don't know the data models and the cause behind them, and to generate agreements to promote a socially responsible use of this type of resources. It's a tool that will be used, it's unavoidable uh, that it will have penetration, so we need to try and see what's the best way for it to be used uh, with a purpose that is prosperous for all. A challenge for Latin America and other regions with a lot of inequalities has to do with expanding gaps. You know, the ex already existing gaps in relation to digital skills that are quite big in some sectors in particular related to the more vulnerable sectors in population and also those that have no access. A, a large part of rural schools in Latin America have no connectivity, practically no devices. So we have a huge challenge. How to have this tool that's a synonym of equity in rich countries where almost everyone has access to these resources. How do we have this divide not to continue, continue to expand? Thank you so much, Florencia. A very valid point in relation to equity and cultural diversity. Everything you said, very relevant. It calls my attention what you're commenting, this lack of the cultural diversity of data, that there are millions and millions of documents in ChatGPT. Of course, you don't have the Aboriginal people's languages, minority languages, this diversity that is uh, so specific to humanity and it's not present there. It's a tool created in a specific part of the world. Most men, white men, most probably, in a certain level in the social scale. So that's very important. There's a lot of bias behind this, and we need to see in the next steps how to increase the diversity. So thank you very much. Let us continue. I would love to continue talking about the different points, but now we will hear Majo from UNICEF. She is a specialist in digital education of UNICEF at our Latin America and Caribbean regional office. Thank you so much, Majo. Let me ask you about these documents that UNICEF is preparing and that you have released a year ago, uh, some of them. What are the ethical considerations and recommendations that you may have in applying this in education, thinking of the children mainly? what would be these requirements to work with children and young people? How can we contribute with better public policies or to improve in the care of, of the children and taking care of their rights? Thank you so much. We are to consider all these topics at all times. Let me now, considering what's just been said, the webinar, we need to think that these tools are here to stay. There will be no tops. This is already a disruptive variable in our practices. And I think that the best that we can do now is to take this moment to reimagine and rethink our teaching learning practices with this variable that's no new 
and it won't be the it's not the first one it won't be the last one so how can we consider that it's a good time to use or and leverage from the power of these new technologies to improve the education experience of children and teenagers and also our practices as teachers so now let me answer about ethical considerations. Let me just put on the table first that most of the technologies are not generated or developed to conceive based on the infancies. And chat GPT and AI in general is no exception. And this is more serious if we consider that children and adolescents are not only users of technologies and beneficiaries of these tools, but they are also making decisions in virtual spaces. They are stakeholders. They are part of the digital learning ecosystem. So we need to consider their active role in the ecosystem and technologies still today are not being developed with a vision around infancies. So to start having AI with a strong view of infancies, there are ethical guidelines to be had into account. For instance, many mentioned around the webinar when we have dialogues around AI, it has to do with transparency, data privacy, academic ethics. This is something that we have heard, but there are other aspects that are not heard that much and Helen touched upon in relation to biases and discrimination that they are that we can have within the algorithm of chat GPT or other AI tools. Even the nature of these tools, these are biases and these are ways of discrimination that happens in record times and impact not only the information that we consume, but the decisions that we make. So there you see this double risk you, and we need to consider this when legislating and generating protocols around these technologies. Another aspect that's even less popular that should be at the top of the agenda for all of us, it has to do with equitable access to these technologies. We need to ask ourselves, who are we developing these technologies for? The chat GPT was generated thinking of infancies with and without disabilities, indigenous teenagers, a girl in the rural areas. You know, this is an opportunity to start thinking of the infancies in plural, that technologies need to consider it an heterogeneous population and AI should be inclusive and equitable as from its own DNA, as from what it is built. And as from that, we have seen, we have started developing some guidelines for AI to start considering this and to have a strong view on infancies. For this, we have some requirements. I, I'm not going to cover all this now, but let me cover three requirements for AI to consider to be centered on children and adolescents to guarantee participation and inclusion of children and adolescents, not only for the development of technologies, but also for the development of the policy that will legislate these technologies. These they are stakeholders, they are decision makers. We need to hear their voices, generate spaces, opportunities and resources so that we can have their voices, the voices of boys, girls, and teenagers in these spaces. And together with this guide thought by UNICEF thinking of an infant, infancy or childhood based AI, we need global consultation and we consulted in our region what is for them AI, what benefits they consider, what are their fears and needs, and what do they need from decision makers in relation to AI? And I think the results that we obtained with this 
survey is very valuable. And, and these are things that we might not think of, but in practice, boys and girls experience this day in and day out. This is a requirement, participation, but another requirement has to do with the preparation of boys, girls, and teenagers for the present AI in the present and in the future. And Helen, if you allow me, I heard that what we're experiencing now in relation to AI is only the tip of the iceberg of all of the opportunities and all the prejudices that we will have in the future. We still can't visualize what's coming uh, and we still don't know how it will impact our daily lives. So the best we can do, and my colleagues mentioned this before, is to be able to make the most of it, to be prepared and equipped with these skills. It's not only technical use, it has to do with digital citizenship, a digital literacy and soft skills that are transferable, that are so useful in this context that need to be developed together with digital aspects, critical thinking, empathy, effective communication that boys, girls and teenagers and I, actually everyone needs to navigate these spaces in a safe, responsible, positive manner. And finally, the guideline, and it closes with this, let me wrap up, to generate a propitious environment. That is to say, we sometimes get lost with sophisticated debates that many times do not adapt to local agendas because we are in different moments of the use of AI. So, a good environment has to do with, while having these debates and opening up these debates, let's not forget that right now we have millions of children that are disconnected in the region that have not had the privilege of accessing all the good that AI can provide. And we need to continue to work with connectivity infrastructure, infrastructure to close the digital divide so that all this does not reach the usual suspects only, but to have the strong inclination and willingness to reach all those invulnerable situations. Let me close here and uh, hear you now. Thank you so much, Majo. We want to consider UNESCO words as well, inclusion and equity and the UN in general and all the world work done to revitalize what we understand by the right to education. This right to education needs to include the digital dimension, the connectivity that is required, not only connecting the cables, right? We need to have this structure to so that everyone can know what technology is to use it, but being part of the political decision and the creation processes for the, of these technologies. So very interesting to hear you. Majo, we will continue this debate on these topics, but now we will hear from the next panel member, Helen A. Crompton. Uh, to give you the opportunity for an extra question to Helen. Helen, I'm speaking Spanish, you're hearing the translation. I would like to ask you as a teacher, you're a teacher, a professor, what kind of training and support you think that teachers need, educators in general needs to truly prosper in the AI era? How can we be prepared for the next evolution that's already with us? There are new tools. So how do we do as teachers? How do I face these realities that are harsh and situations of exclusion, etc.? So what can I do to, to use this, to learn myself and to use this the best way possible? Thank you, Helen. We hear you. So that is one of the most crucial questions, how educators can be prepared. And we also have to remember the place of educators at the moment. 
they went through COVID where everybody had to quickly learn online tools and how to educate in different ways. And we thought there could be nothing worse. And then ChatGPT appeared, which caused great worry to educators globally. I'm having the same questions from pretty much every country of the world. And educators kind of focus on certain things such as students can cheat. You know, it's plagiarism, it's, it's doing all these different things. I would say to them, well, first of all, for training, they need time to actually take this in. And fear often comes from not knowing. We need to change that over to, okay, these things are happening. There is cheating, but there's ways to get around. So I mentioned earlier about things like um, plagiarism checks are not working, but there are other things that can be done to stop students using that way. Well, first one is digital competency. We need to get students educated in using technologies for appropriate means, as well as safeguarding themselves. But also for things like, if we think they're cheating, we can look at the way that they've written text. And if you get familiar with ChatGPT, it actually writes in a kind of format that becomes familiar. And there are other things such as if a student writes about something that's not been covered in class, they can be asked saying, oh, it was interesting that you wrote about that. Tell me more. You know, and often these things can be found out. And then thinking about even other negative sides such as, so we're kind of putting the positive on these negatives in that, okay, it doesn't always get things right, which is great because have students produce text, let's look for these inconsistencies or places that we might not agree with, or let's look for biases in the text. These will always be there in everything. I'm not sure how we can actually um, say that we could ever create a tool that wouldn't have some bias in it because it's developed by humans and it's learning from us. That's what AI is doing. It's like a child learning what we give it. And we are terribly biased so we need it's very important that we cut down on that but we also need to understand as well and have our students understand and like was mentioned earlier we need to use have teachers focus on the pedagogies the andragogies even the hootagogies you know self-driven learning to say this is just a tool this is a technology it's how we use the technology is the most purposeful that we can get the best results from really thinking about how it's used. And we've said for years in education, we want to transform education to make it more student-centered. We want to have critical thinking. We want to do all these things. I've actually never seen a great movement towards that yet. ChatGPT, I believe, is the thing that hopefully is going to set us in that direction of looking how we're assessing students. Do we need to do things this way that we've done for a long time, decades, centuries? Perhaps we need to start moving towards more transformative learning and having educators look at those pedagogies that can get the best out of the tool. And we are at the tip of the iceberg. People or organizations, countries that are saying, let's ban ChatGPT. ChatGPT is already out there. There's now no pulling it back. It's already there. These tools are available and it's all we're already in um, hundreds of programs already. It's not just ChatGPT as a standalone. It's already embedded in many things. So we need to think about how to use it quickly for those positives, because there's going to be a lot of people wanting to use it for the negatives. So we need to get ahead. Thank you, Val. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. Very good points there. I don't dare to try to summarize. Perdón, tengo que pasar español. I will continue in Spanish. Thank you so much, Helen. Very interesting points, a lot of points. Let me bring at least one question as from the community that we have. 
in the chat. Just summarizing a few of the concerns that we see is plagiarism. How can we work with this? If a student is sending an essay using chat GPT and we know, will that be considered plagiarism? Who dares answer here? Let me say that that happens in many universities. And you can quote ChatGPT. If you are doing academic work using ChatGPT, you need to name it. You need to include it when you deliver your essay, right? By providing credits to ChatGPT. So I think that what Helen said, we need to leverage this opportunity to ask ourselves, what are the activities that we propose to students? The same happened when we had the World Wide Web and general access to internet. Teachers, all of us teachers, we had to change the way we were teaching our classrooms because students were distracted with their computers and the type of activities. And now what is demanded as from a teacher? Just reading out text with information it's not a transformative activity. And that's what ChatGPT can do. This interpolates us in the way of we teach. And I agree with Helen that it's very easy to recognize ChatGPT type of text because it has an algorithmic type of construction. You see the print of the algorithm in the way that uh, grammatically the paragraphs are constructed. This is A, this is B, this is C. A, B, and C, you know, in summary is that. So it has a formula. So with that, as Helen said, it's important for teachers to get familiar with the tool, to learn about it, not to be afraid about it, to know what it can be used, what can be used, and truly leverage on it, and to be able to approach the challenges because this is going to be a transformative practice. Great, excellent. Martin, I believe this question invites us to reflect on the type of product, pedagogic product that we request from students. That is to say, do we continue, for instance, do we say there's going to be a task for, and students need to have a month to hand in a, an essay and it's not discussed in the class for a month and then the students are to hand in something you know that obviously is opening the road to for students to go to chat gpt and just you know deliver what they get but if i teach and in my classes throughout the months i'm asking the students some progress or i can ask them show me your dialogue with ChatGPT to discover the first ideas. So they ask ChatGPT and they can put a different point of view and that's the first pro product. And I see through the process how students can use ChatGPT for a reflexive deep process that can be a lot more enriching than only writing a basic essay. It can you can go a lot more in depth or creativity, critical thinking. It has to do with the type of task we give to our students and also how we focus on the whole pedagogic process to strengthen the link between students and teachers. I think ChatGPT can be a peer and we can reflect with this peer and it's handy both for students as well as for teachers. Thank you so much, Martin. We had another debate uh, at ISAL, Institute of Superior Education, and they spoke a lot about this, how to improve the pedagogy. If it's only to deliver a, an essay after a certain period of time, then we are not focusing properly because here we're talking about a process. So several 
aspects on how to improve uh, the pedagogy in a more active manner. Is there anything to be added, Mario? Just a reflection I'm having us from this last question. It's not the million dollar question. And I'm thinking of this, and I would like us to reflect on that. There is a, still a vacuum in listening the voices of teachers on the field that are seeing the positive and negative effects, the gray areas of what ChatGPT brings to the classroom itself. I would like to have this kind of spaces so teachers and professors, young children, young, young people, have already perhaps solutions or ideas and we need to hear them out and we need to hear uh, firsthand their own voices. Thank you so much, Majo. Well, we only have a few minutes and we have a challenge now for all panel members, the million dollar questions. You are in front of the Minister, Minister of Education in your country. You're facing the top authorities about education in the world. What can we say to the Ministry of uh, Minister of Education? How do we push this agenda? How do we incorporate this technology? After everything we heard, what can you recommend to the minister and to a teacher who wants to start? Or if there's no time, just go for the minister or a teacher choose i can go ahead for the for the minister perhaps that we need definitely more regulations and more policies so they're just emerging at the moment and it's like hitting a moving target because it's constantly changing but educators as well around the world are calling for regulations at this level so that's a quick one from me Thank you, Helen. Y hago publicidad de la recomendación de UNESCO. Pueden eh, utilizar la recomendación de, de la ética en el Perú. And you can, you, you can all use the recommendation by UNESCO uh, about AI. Who else has something to say? Let me go for the teacher, as Helen spoke to the minister already. And as she talked about regulation, that's very relevant on how to solve the challenges. We need to focus on opportunities, I believe, as well. I think this kind of tool is very motivating for young people. Secondary school, for instance, they are more and more immersed in these type of realities. Children and young people are more used to living in this world reality generated by computers. So this could be very good for them for making inquiries and for self-learning. So I will propose teachers to do a class on chat GPT that the, all of the students can help to investigate how it was created, the problems it has to take it as a project because it's something that is interesting for everyone and to integrate that as from a critical manner not to turn the back on it, but not to trust it blindly, to see the way how these tools can be integrated because the young people and the children, they are already using it. So we need to find the way not to have such a distance between the reality of students outside the school and the reality within the education and education institutions. Thank you, Florencia. Majo. Is there anything you would like to comment? Thank you, Val. As you were saying, ministers, decision makers, I think that as there is quite a momentum now and we can make the most of it to bring everything from the field. We need to not to forget that the children, um, the young people are stakeholder in this ecosystem and to consider AI and digital agendas are different in the different countries. So some are more advanced, some others have other agendas, but it's very important to develop evidence 
on where we are in the development of AI to respond to local realities. And let me leave it at that. Thank you so much. I think I didn't skip anybody. May I? Well, thank you so much. I would like to continue with the debate, but time is up. We will have further opportunities in the future. But as a summary, to repeat together, I believe that to make the most of the benefits that we heard about AI and to put them in the services of SDGs, SDG4, the right of education that we mentioned and to mitigate the risks that we have, we need to answer questions that have to do with pol key policies. What specific actions can we generate when we are considering this alignment, the contribution of this technology to SDG number four specifically? How can we guarantee ethical, inclusive, equitable use of technologies for learning? Let's remember that we have a huge crisis in learning in our region. So this needs to be able to help us cover this big challenge that we have in Latin America and the Caribbean. And third, how can education prepare human beings to live, to work with these technologies? Being citizens in this cycle, the champions in global citizens, citizenship. We have seen successes and failures. The impact on education will depend on how we build together this field of AI and education applications. We need specific actions to create augmented intelligence with humans at the center, augmented intelligence where we as humans are at the center for people to truly know what it is and how AI works and the best way possible then be able to receive the support by these systems and not be carried away by the systems. This is built collectively as we're doing here at the level of the whole system of a country, a region, the planet, and with different ministries, not only education, the different ministries in a government, all the stakeholders, the whole educational ecosystem, including teachers, families, communities, so that we together can create this social contract for the transformation of education. This would be the key ingredients in our view. And for all these, to have UNICEF, all of our colleagues present here today to continue pushing this agenda. We have the children with very interesting contributions. We invite you to be to hear the Global Education Monitoring Report. We are going to have this in Uruguay. You can be present in Uruguay with us. You're going to have a space to discuss these topics as well. We'll also have the Regional Forum of Polit Education Policies by the UNESCO Education Planning and ORELAC. This will happen in October, June 26 in Uruguay, and then October. We will have ministerial conferences at OVE, at UNESCO, and a ministerial meeting in October for sure with the ministries of education and one of the topics in the agenda will have to do with digital transformation it's a very productive very active year we invite you all to continue this discussion together and supporting each other to in building education with these technologies that are a reality with all the elements that we discussed today thank you once again you uh, panel members and we want to thank everyone hearing us. Best regards from us at UNESCO Orelac.
thank you.